Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. First one in my family to do it felt like, what, a year of tests, physicals, medicals, where you think, I've made it, but don't get too excited because you've got the next stage to still go. I just scanned it and it said, congratulations. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be a firefighter. I'm going to be in the fire service. And what, we're now 16, coming up 17 years on. This is what we're going to learn. This is how we're going to teach it. And then when we have ones that struggle, oh, well, they're just not listening. Actually, no, let's not be like that. What is it? They are listening. They're just not looking because they're making notes or they're drawing pictures to relate. They are being receptive. We're just being very small minded about it and thinking that that's how I learned it. Yeah, but that's not how everyone learns. If you give us everything, we will give you 110% back. You've got to have the right attitude. And if you are putting in the work and you've got the one, I'll give you it back tenfold. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide Gore-Tex going further together Sarah welcome to the podcast how the hell are you I'm very well, Pete. I'm very well. How are you? I'm awesome. I know you're very sore because you've been kicking ass and taking names yesterday as a crazy CrossFit monkey up and down the country so how's the body feeling? Uh, like it's been beat up to be honest everything aches every part of my body aches but uh, oh. but i love it so it's it good. is it's isn't good. it and we were yeah, saying it's it, that, that, that kind of primal that thing it's that connects that body to that primal thing that we kind of need and i wonder if that's why uh, so many people are attracted to more physical jobs like the emergency services sometimes as well i feel like it's people that don't fit into normal society the the quirkies and the misfits and the round school pegs for square holes that yes. tend to find more of a home in things like emergency services now I know we've had a whole bunch of conversations in the past and we've kind of been bromancing over learning styles and neurodiversity and all that sort of stuff. And that's because we share similar passions. But for those, obviously, nobody knows you or lots of people know you, but no one on the context of the, context of the podcast might have heard of you before. So give us a little whistle stop tour of kind of who you are, maybe when you join the fire service and what you do now. Right, okay. So I'm Sarah Bromley. Um, I'm currently a, a crew manager, a uh, training instructor at the training and development department at uh, headquarters. So uh, love that job. Not always done it. Uh, I think I've been doing it now for the past year properly as a crew manager. Um, joined the fire service when I was 19. So it's pretty much all I've known. Um, did 12 years as a firefighter and then thought, I want to change. I want challenge. I want something to push me. I want to make a bit of a difference. A bit geeky, but very true. So I did some temporary stuff uh, as training instructor, recruit instructor, um, and loved it. So got a taste for it, and then was like, I want that to be my substantial role. And now that's what I do, and I absolutely love it. So you joined when you were nineteen. Yeah, nineteen. Yeah. So I was wow. like, I want an active job. I want to make a difference. Give back to the public. Very true, by the way. Very cheesy, but. Yeah, and I was like, oh, the fire service. Why? Is the family cool. in connection? Is the no, not really. services, nursing, policing, firing? Nope. First one in my family to do it. Uh, my cousin currently works in um, another service um, as a firefighter, and he's done it, but I was the first one to do it. But no, I had a friend. He um, was in the service, uh, a very good friend, and he was like, you would love it. It's so fit you, your personality. And he was like, go on, go on, try it. And I was like... I have mentioned this briefly, like secondary school, me and my friends thought it'd be cool. And I thought, yeah, all right, why not? And when he took me to hand in my application, it was like, let's make sure we get it there. And then, yeah, and then it felt like, what, a year of tests, physicals, medicals, where you think, I've made it, but don't get too excited because you've got the next stage <laughs> to still go. That's a right roller coaster. that. You've passed your medical, oh, but you've got your interview. You've got your formal interview. And I was thinking, oh. And then I think it must have been, beginning of December one year that I got the massive pack it would never come through the post now would it just be an email or something <laughs> yeah. but 
this pack came through the post. And I was like, this, there's too much in this for it to be a rejection because surely I'm not that bad. Yeah. And I just scanned <laughs> it and it said, congratulations. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be a firefighter. I'm going to be in the fire service. And then I was like, what a nice early Christmas present this is. And what we're now 16, coming up 17 years on, I'm still here. I, haven't... I think we joined literally around the same time then. Because I joined when I was 18, and I think I'm 17, 18 years in it, which is, so you would have been around 2007, 2008. Yeah, 2007, yeah, was the, when I joined on station, yeah. Oh, that is beautifully very similar then, in a very weird is, way. Because yeah. yeah. we'll have seen the different tragedies and the different changes and the different PPE things and the different structures and the pays. and Because we saw the first set of strike action not after we came in, didn't we? It was so not very long at all, yeah. Yeah, and then they hadn't done it that for That was weird. Time. It was very weird because we were so probably young into it and there was like pressures from different unions yeah. and solidarity and all this sort of stuff. And you're still focused yeah. on trying to be a good firefighter. And I kind of think about that now because obviously we've just narrowly missed we have, um, yeah. uh, some industrial action, which is great. And we thank everybody in different unions for doing all their bits and bobs. But again, we're doing so much recruitment at the minute, which is what you and I are so passionate about. But yes. did, you in the, did you in the training department have to come up with a plan to train external personnel for um yes. yeah we did as well we had a one day throw all the shit at the wall plan for, for yeah. like retired fire and i think a lot of them were retired firefighters or g4 security or there was a couple of other companies because the military weren't going to do it this time so there was we were going to pay yeah. i didn't know we actually pay a big insurance fee every year just in case we have to use these I don't know, I don't know. yeah which kind of well, makes yeah. sense if we have to call we upon have them a- yeah like the resilience we've had in hmm. funnily enough the higher up have taken that training role though because oh. there was very much <clears throat> how is this going to play out because they're coming in getting paid more than us how is this going to play out um and sad. yeah and it, was, it like, implies that you are not going to be professional in training them and that you might make them feel horrible or have the fuckums or whatever which i think is a little bit naughty because we were allowed to do it they, they they gave me the remit of planning the day and okay the, yeah the content so it was just yeah. we weren't going to wear ba we had to teach them pumps and ladders familiarization yeah. and then MDTs and incident command. And blah, yeah, blah, kind blah. of like say the base stuff that makes them like safe to ride. But yeah, we did have that contingency planning just in case, which mm-hmm. it's lovely um, that we didn't have to obviously go down that avenue. But you'd, it does, it casts your mind back to obviously the first time we was a part of it. And I do think it was a weird time because like you say, you, you're young, new into it. You think the whole pers- like prospect <clears> of striking <throat> and you think, Oh God, what does that mean? What can we do? What can't we do? I've just joined. I want to serve my community, but I also, like you say, want to stand as, as like brother and sister, brothers and sisters and do what's right. Yeah. And you think, oh, the public are going to hate us. Like, how again, that thing we spoke about briefly before, how are we going to get perceived? Because people are not going to, so there's only people there that just think, they want more money straight away. That's all it's about. Yeah, and it's an easy it's, indicator. That's where everybody jumps yeah. at. And there is an element to it, you know, you know, as much as, it's a weird thing, romantically in the fire service, we say we, we join it for the passion. It's not about the outcome or the income or all that sort of stuff. It's about the difference that you make in the community, which is true to an extent, but you can't do it for free. Um, no. So it's also, you know, it's just the necessity of life. Money is an, is an enabler. It's a thing that people need to be able to live. Yes. But So you were a firefighter on station for 12 years. Um, Yeah, pretty much. Um, Yeah, for 12, it would have been about yeah, 10, 12 years before I kind of wanted more. So yeah. That's, what does that's, wanting that's... more look like? Because some people will do that forever, and that's absolutely fine. Some people want to stay on stations and be a firefighter, career firefighters. When we need them, they make the world go round, and yeah. they're incredible people. They're the backbone of the emergency services. But a lot of people, more so than would admit, I think, personally, have that itch to go, oh, you know that thing Sarah's doing? Fucking hell, I saw her with the recruits the other week and it looked really good and it was fun and like, God, I missed that bit. And then someone's like, no, countdown's on in a minute. Shut the fuck up. Come on, let's go and sit in the tea room. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Yes. Let's go and moan about the new piece of equipment or yeah. moan about it. And that's not all firefighters. That's a horrible generalization. But why, what What changed? And when did, when did, when did it change versus when did you do something about it? Because usually yes. like, people yeah. feel the itch and then they might have an itch for six years and then well, yeah, maybe never wait for that opportunity, haven't you? Um, it literally was, I was talking to a friend who was um, looking at, they, they was, they're a teacher, I think they still are actually, and was talking about how they see their future and I want to be head of department and then this. And I was like, that's really cool. And I was thinking, do I want more? 
maybe I do. Literally, it was this conversation in the car. Went back to work on uh, the next the next uh, next tour that we was on, and just by pure coincidence, there was in uh, like a weekly siren, um, very high service, um, little <laughs> newsletter, and there was on about um, an opportunity to be a recruit instructor. And I was like, So is that for like the was, have a go days? For like um, no, it was the whole time and on call? Oh, the it was, yeah, was looking for um, basically just a, a pure, like four or five um, individuals to just be purely recruit instructors because the training department were just on the bones of it. They were doing so much that they just wanted so only five instructors to just do the recruits, whole time recruitment. Um, it'd be a temporary promotion to watch manager. Um, and I was like, this is amazing. I, I think tra- since the day I joined again, when I went through my initial recruit training, I thought these people are amazing. Yeah. Like they are so knowledgeable. I want to be you. Literally yeah. did think that. I was like, how do they know so much? How do they keep it all in? And then <laughs> I was like, this is incredible. So then I was like, wow, this is my chance to do that bit now. Yeah. So I was like, right, well, that's watch manager level. I'm a firefighter. Am I, I could I do that two jump, that two rank jump? But they said anyone. They said firefighter, crew manager, if you're currently a watch manager somewhere else. So I was like, I'm going to go for this. So my watch manager at the time, he was brilliant, put in the work, stayed up till, <clears throat> sorry, midnight with me. What have you done? What courses have you done? What? Why you? Why will you be a good fit? And I put it in and did what I needed to do, went and taught a drill to the instructors, which is really weird, hmm. um, and did interviews. Did you have to use um, a mnemonic for it? Um, no, no, I didn't. Um, we have this put- Finns WDC, which they use in some services, where oh, okay. we go through incident command development. We also use it where people come into the department. Because what you're saying, they're like, stand and deliver. People go, yeah, I'm a great firefighter. I, I, I know how to do a drill. I know how you. I know you know how to do a drill as as a contributing part of the drill. Yes, and I'm not saying this is fucking magic. You know, I'm not saying it, but it is just different. It's just to understand that that stand and deliver that fact that you are there to create. You're there to give the training ground a big cuddle. You you need to create a bubble of safety, which in this thing is going to exist because you as a firefighter know not to fall off the cliff and know not to slip over yeah. on the thing. But as the instructor, it's them. You're at, so the Finns WDC was um, fall in, identify yourself, number the crews off, yeah. safety, words of command, detail the drill, and then confirm understanding. I think was yeah. the C, and it so was like we, that. So it's like bang, bang, yeah. bang, get everybody, yeah. get them, get them switched on, make sure they know what they're doing, brief them, make sure they know the safety words, and people really struggle with that sometimes. Yeah. So without even knowing it, that's pretty much what we fell into anyway. Like you said, you had that pattern, didn't you? You'd, and then yeah. I practice it with my crew on the station at the time. Cause I was thinking I need to get this right. And you do, you go through it. And it's quite funny when you do it with people, you know, cause they obviously take the piss and, and they're like, Oh, yeah. you're not very good. And I think you're not really helping. Shut up. Just fall in line. <laughs> well, you do the number in. But yeah. yeah, like you said, it's different. They wanted someone that could teach recruits. Mm. So it's people that it's brand new to them. So they needed to see you do that pattern. They needed to yes. see that you could command and control that environment. So yeah, did all that, did the interview um, and got the call. I was actually in the gym and then got the call and was like, they said, oh, I would like to ask me, how do you think it went? And I said, <laughs> I'll find out in a minute when you carry on. And they said, <laughs> we'd like to offer you a job. And I actually said, do you really? And he said, yeah. Honestly, is that, isn't it? That moment is just crazy. And I was I, like, I had gone through 22 processes to, well, to yeah. get the uh, position that I'm currently in. But I'm yeah. for a variety of positions, crew, watch manager, different service. And when they rang for this one, they said, uh, you know, congratulations, like, offer the position. And I was like, okay, yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, Because I was mentally conditioned. And, they, uh, and okay, then they yeah. kept talking. And they they started talking about a start date, and I said, "So I've not, so I've passed." And you, because I I got so many calls that like, you've passed the process, you're in a point, you're appointable, but you didn't get it this time. Yes. As in, like you yeah. met the mark, but we gave it yeah. to somebody else. And I was yeah. so used to that that I completely missed the fact that they were actually giving it to me. Yes. Until they started talking about a start date, and I was like, "What song? You want me to go and do it?" Oh, this is real. <laughs> yeah, it's me now. Thanks. It's my turn. <laughs> But it's quite a nice people. surreal moment because you put all that time and effort into something you really want. And then, like you say, you get it. Because afterwards I was like, oh, God, what do I do? I definitely need to finish this session in the gym first and then I'll go out and celebrate. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh. But it is, it's a, a surreal moment. So that's when it changed. It literally, 
I had this in my head. I went back the next tour, a job opportunity came up and I went for it. And yeah, I got it as a temporary, a temporary watch manager. Um, but I was like, my God, as if I've jumped two ranks temporarily as well. I was like, I really need to be very, very good now to prove that I'm, like, I am capable of this. And it was amazing. How did you deal with that pressure? Because talk about not the elephant in the room, but I've got Sabrina Cohen Hatton coming on in a couple of weeks. And it's a really important thing to speak about. Like if, if a man would jump two ranks, they go, oh yeah, we know fucking Dave. He's the mustard. He's a great firefighter. Yeah. Okay. doesn't mean he'll be a great watch manager. And there's almost that unspoken sometimes, especially when it's with women, where some people can feel like, oh, they've done that two jump because of X, Y, Z, or because she's a woman or because of this. And you're like, well, no, the advert was there for anybody. So there will be other firefighters. Did you experience any of that? Was there any kind of like inner imposter syndrome? Was there any kind of, oh God, whatever, what are people going to think, say, do? There's always that with me. I wonder what people think of say and do. Absolutely. And the guy that offered me the job, it's weird that he said it because then it made me think you must have heard it because after he offered me the job, he then said, because it must have been when I said, oh, are you sure you want to give it to me? He'd said, um, and also if anyone says to you or even like instigates that it was possibly because you're a female, he said, it is absolutely not. He said you was the best candidate for the job. End of. And to be fair, he was a very straight talking guy. And I thought <clears> that's <throat> fair. Um, a little bit, I did think, oh, Right now, I'm the only female instructor on this course. I think I was currently at that time as well, the only uh, training um, female in the department as a whole. Mm. And you do think, have I got more to prove? Yeah, I think, to be fair, I've always got that in me as just one of my personality traits. But then I want people to think she's a really good female instructor, which is bad because I've put female in there myself. But Mm. I do because I want people to think, yeah, I'm a good instructor, but I do want to bring that female aspect to it because Mm. I think it does make a difference. It is still a tremendous uh, minority. We had one uh, one lady in the training department two years ago, and then she moved to another service for the promotion. And then we just had another female join the department. So now we have one female. Oh, that's a lie, in fact. So we have two, but one works in instant command, which is okay. not, in, not in the same building as us. Yeah. Um, but one works uh, with us in this team now. And she's absolutely incredible. But I had a challenge the other day when we were doing a BA reaccreditation and this individual was giving some contribution. And on the second occasion, because I let it ride on the first one, it was a second occasion where just an old hat had been in there 20 years. He's now a part-time instructor. And he kept speaking over her. And she's a naturally mm-hmm. softer spoken person. I don't know if that is a gender bias because I think women tend to be politer and or more softly spoken. Not all. They tend to be softly spoken or then they're over-indexed and become really loud. Sometimes. Maybe that's a horrible generalization. But... This guy did it for the second time. And I said, I'm going to stop you there, mate. I said, I was just getting so-and-so's thoughts on this. Can you carry on? And then he did that sort of backwards face at you where you got yeah. like, like, go, that's a bit rude, Pete. And I said, okay, we can deal with it now then. I said, that is oh. the second time you have spoken over this person whilst they are mid-conversation. Yes. I, said, I thought I thought she'd finished. I said, how'd she finish speaking? I said, how would we resolve this this input here? So the fact that I have to specifically ask them to speak again is because I'm having to silence you. And obviously she was like, oh, no, it's fine. I don't mind. I says, okay, if you don't mind. I says, but that's a behavior. And if you start speaking over me or another member of the team, they may not mind as much as you. It's wonderful that you're polite. Yeah. I said, but I want everybody's inf- I want everybody's input on this because we were all talking about a student's performance. Okay, yeah. This person who observed on a thermal imaging camera the recording and he had also observed it from a different part of the department where you can also view the content. So he was coming over to give his unsolicited input. <laughs> and she was giving her, because she had a form where we mark the assessment of oh, the, okay. the yeah, wearer. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you've done it myself. And, and then it's like, we were talking about it. And it just really pissed me off. But it's like a micro example of some people will naturally let others speak over them. So like, how, how has your time been coming in? You know, as in like, did you have any of that initial? Because you also like, oh, I'm new, so I'm here to learn. And yeah, no, you know more than me, so you talk. But at some point, that's got a shift into, uh, and you, you've been given the job because yeah. you have value to add. Yes. But if people speak over you all the time, how are you going to add the value? Yeah, see, the team I went into, they were pretty a good bunch uh, of guys um, and they were quite helpful. Um, but I tend to, I tend to do it where when I'm new to a role, kind of sit back. I couldn't, I couldn't because at the same time, there was a lot that we had to sort out for this whole time course. And I was one of five um, doing that 
a solely recruitment uh, course, but yeah, there was quite what was the good. Five, sorry, not as in the names. What was the mix? Was it firefighters, crew managers, watch managers? Um, watch no, or? they was all. So, so two of them was already currently training instructors. Uh, so they'd had about three or four courses under the belt, which then I thought, oh God, I was like, because rank um, are they then? Not that it they should matter. Was, but... No, no, they was they was watch managers. So in the training, I know it varies because my current um, current service is different. But then um, there was all watch managers. You had you had to be a watch manager, which was why the jump was two ranks yeah. um, for myself. So they was watch managers. The and the other two guys were watch managers, but one was in a different department and one was out on station. So they was all watch managers. Possibly one, maybe a crew manager, up to watch manager, but no one else came in firefighter to watch. So again, that was a bit daunting for me because I was thinking, you've already been at a, like a, a leadership rank. You've done three courses. You've done three courses. And then I was like, and then this other guy, he'd been in for ages and he was just like really good at teaching and delivery. And I was thinking, oh my God, I've like got so much to learn in such a small space of time and everything was brand new. It wasn't like, oh, last course we did this. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot for me to learn. So I naturally did the whole step back thing. Yeah, um, a shadow on a few courses first, just because yeah. you know how to do the thing, but it's like, how do we deliver it? What's the resources? What's How does the day flow? Yeah, and there's so much in that goes into the preparation for a 12, 14 week recruits course that I was like, mind blown because i was like wow like (sighs) this is a lot yeah fill in that written down in like a process flow because some some departments i've been and visited across the uk rely on yeah we know how to run a course okay show me and they go you'll have to come and watch one no show me the thing and i don't i don't need a lesson plan for everything but just show me your scheme of work show me where this is because otherwise it relies on a lot of like I said to somebody the other day, they would um, show me a scheme of work for something they planned. And I said, where's the familiarization with radios? And he just said, oh, well, I, I, know, I know we need to do that. So I was thinking of just throwing it into this session here. I said, okay, but it's not it's not on there. Yes. I said, let's assume you go sick the day before. Touch wood, you don't, but, you know, let's say you have a car crash. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this course now. I'm doing it because yep. I'm going to step in. I'm, I'm an yep. instructor. This is scheme of work. I'm not going to do radios. Because it's not on there. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not going to do radio familiarization. I'm not going to yeah. run any scenarios and message structure in because it's not on this scheme yeah. of work. Or like whatever. you said, you should be able to pick up that. <laughs> any instructor should be able to pick up that and be like, deliver it. And we've literally recently been talking about this. So for hours, how we set up currently is we have got this ridiculously huge whiteboard. Good. And it splits up every single day. And you go in and you think, wow, if people didn't know what it was, they'd come in and be like, mind blown. And it's got (laughs) all 14 weeks, five days a week, and it's got what we'll do. So that's like the brief overview where they they all get together and then brainstorm all the heads of the departments. um, As as just a private thing, I will leave this in the recording. Can you take some photos of that and send them to me privately? I I won't post on my social media or anything like that. But just as like a... Because we want to keep going to different services and trying to mm. learn lessons. That we've got some very new people in the department, yeah, and I'd yeah. love to have that mind explosion. Because you never know yeah. what you don't know. You know what I mean? No, well, so you go somewhere else like and go. Oh, I didn't think about yeah. doing it that way. Yeah, of course. Mm. Yeah, like we have obviously it's their head because the crew managers currently um, in in the service I'm in. Well, majority have crew managers and instructors, and then you'll have the watch manager who's the head of BA, watch manager head of RTC, and a watch manager head of core. So those three will get together and the planner. And they'll just, it will, it'll be brain jumping. One will be like, like what should we do this week? Yeah. Um, what are we putting in this week? And then unfortunately, we've had, obviously the bank holidays, which is brilliant <laughs> for us. But then we're like, wow, we've actually got 13 weeks. So that's a massive brain dump. And then we have a weekly planner. So every week you get it sent out. So it's very, it's, it is very organized. I do like that. Which instructors are needed at what time? Your initials are, re- are next <clears> to what you'll be delivering. And then again, we break it down further to, like you say, the schemes of work and the lesson plans. So yes. that if the three of us that are in the BA department, I'm off and I'm delivering the entry control and I'm off, but I've wanted to go to talk about a certain element or do like a, a practical element just to enforce the theory that I've delivered. Well, what's the other crew manager? He, he picks it up and what I'm just going to do ad hoc and go, oh yeah, go around with it. And then yeah. he's been thinking that it doesn't say it here. Like you said, it needs to be so any of us can pick it up 
because yeah. we're all instructors and go, I can deliver this same content that Sarah would that Sarah yeah, would because yeah. it's here for me. So like you said, it, <clears throat> it has to be the structure there. You put your personality into it, of course. Yes. And if you want to give experiences or a little bit extra, but we've still got the same foundation, the same base, and it covers, and there's that consistency there from each instructor. Yeah. Talk to me there, because it's something we went into before we kind of came on about, we kind of referenced it there when you were standing delivering for your, you know, doing your introduction, um, sorry, your interviewing process. But then when you're in the department, what does in your mind, good presentation look like? Because when we're thinking about the different diversities in the room, the different ways people like to be spoken to, there's nothing more frustrating to me than someone going, yeah, I can deliver that presentation. And they can, but they just stand there and read it monotone from the board. And I'm like, ah, yes, I I agree you delivered it, but you weren't there. Perversely, I think that's that's a massive bugbear of mine. Yeah. And because do you really know it or... Anyone yeah. can read it. They could read it. Yeah, yeah. Or we could just give them all the work then, what we're doing while we're here. Yeah. Um, so for me, I've always been as minimal as I can for the, the PowerPoints that are behind me, and they are just prompts. Let's have a conversation because I want to interact. And as we know, everyone's different in the room, but I want people to show that understanding. So I'll do the EDIP principle, like yes. I, the EDIP one. I do like that, like... So I will obviously, as we've noted, but the explain, demonstrate, imitate, practice kind of principle, because I think it works really well. And we tend to do that as across the departments in the training section um, where we do. Obviously, we introduce them to it. We tell them what we're going to cover. Hmm. We'll go into it in theory, but then we'll do like a pra- little practical skill station just to confirm that understanding. Um and theory is a bit boring sometimes. And why do we join this job? Why do we do it? Not to sit in a classroom. Like yeah. we we want to get hands on. And I think it breaks it up. It also then adheres to do you learn better theory? Do you learn pra- better practically? And it is a great mix of the two. Then mm. we'll have a break. Gives it a chance to process. We come back. We'll maybe touch on a little bit more. And then do maybe do another skill station. Then after lunch, which we try and do, get theory all the way out in the morning, in the afternoon, because then they think, yay, the boring bit's done. And then the afternoon, we go out and put it into practice in like a more of a drill scenario. So if we've done entry control, they play about with the board, they make the mistakes, which they're not really mistakes. They're just playing, having a play. Yeah. This is the place to do it. Then we go and put it in drill. Yeah. And they put a bit more pressure on it. And then they, we're still there. It's still learning, ask questions. But then they're like, oh, yeah, it's sunk in now. Because sometimes it's that perception of they're thinking, I don't really understand why she's teaching that or why why we're covering that. And then you go out and it puts context on it and they go, ah, penny drops. Absolutely, 100%. So yeah. as we've sort of spoken in around it there, I'd love for us to kind of go into EDIP. So for people that are unfamiliar, um, we'll just take a little whistle stop tour of the EDIP principle. So EDIP quite simply is like a teaching method used predominantly by emergency services, but also used in school. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, military forces and stuff doing it. Um, and they cover everything from turning on little things like a light switch, you could break all that down, to super complex things like putting up a ladder, doing a BA where, how to get yourself dressed in the morning. And the idiot principle is adapting a method like this for teaching any kind of skill sets that we might have the emergency service. So we've got the E, and people can see this if they Google for it. There's loads of little cycles um, that people can look at for it. So E is the explanation. So explaining to the individual, the student, the client, whatever it may be, in words that they are familiar with, every kind of main part and point of the session. So it's so you don't tell them all of it at once. It's kind of breaking it down step by step, covering off the main salient points of how to achieve the end task. And then D is obviously the demonstrate. So sometimes we'll do a walkthrough, talk through, or we might do it at uh, a slower pace. For, I always say to people, slow is smooth and then smooth is fast. So you're getting them to demonstrate the exercise slowly and methodically in kind of gold standard. You want people to be walking themselves through the process. Try not to give too much input and stop it every second because it can kind of de-chunk that encoding method when people are taking that information in. So as they've walked through the whole demonstration of it, I is then for imitate. So you're getting the individuals themselves to start mirroring or copying the thing they've just seen. So as an example for us, you might get a bunch of, I always like to, I never ask somebody to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So if the instructor cohort allows for it, I will get us to demonstrate the thing itself, whether it's like doing a general check is is a great example of it. You'll break down all the steps. You'll then demonstrate them all physically. 
and then you'll get them to imitate. So you might still have one instructor at the front going through it as well, and then you'll have the students do it along with them. So they can start to build that confidence. They can start to do those first few layers of paint to build that mountain of experience and self-belief that they are someone that is conscious and capable of doing this task. And then you kind of review that, cover those salient coaching points, things that may be a commonalities amongst the group, and then pause and like pertinent points in the exercise to emphasize those coaching points. So you might take them up to step six on the BGA BI general check and then bring the group to a pause as that kind of, there's a void there or there's like a bump in the road that you need to get the whole group over. And then the final P is obviously practice. So getting them to reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. And people always say practice makes perfect, which is not always right. <laughs> Only specific, pertinent, positive practice will create perfection. It needs to be done in a structure. So you've got the explanation, demonstration, imitation, and then practice. That's a nice little edip cycle. And there's a couple of others that we can kind of go into as we move through it. So I want us to go back for a second and look at, you know, we've spoken about instructors and stuff. Everybody's there ultimately for the end customer. So the end customer in this analogy being the brand new recruit, we've both been there, we've both done it ourselves. What are some of the things that you've seen kind of change or what are kind of the, some of the best tips, things that you found difficult coming in and now looking from the other side of the coin, students that have a smooth entry into the training process and perhaps some of those that find it more challenging kind of the reasons why, I suppose. So for me, when I first did it all those years ago, uh, it just feel like forever now, but um, I thought there was a lot to process. Um, <clears throat> I did think, wow, this is a lot. And it's very fast paced yeah. because every day we are building, like now looking from the other side, I'm like, there's a reason why we do it. But at the time as 19, and I've seen on my course, I think, I, well, I was one of the youngest. And as the courses have gone on now, you're seeing that I now feel old. But it's mm. they are very young. We get we are obviously you get the ones that are the thirties, mid thirties, the odd ones that are forty. But you are now. I feel like we're seeing it is around twenties, early thirties that are coming in. Yeah. So why do you think that is? Honestly, I honestly don't know. It's a weird one because I'm like I get it because it was I was there. I was one of them, and it's almost like I remember when I joined. Someone had said to me like, or oh, we was in a conversation. There was a couple of guys that had been in the army, um, in the military, and was kind of saw it that they'd done a bit they'd gathered that information they'd lived a bit out that they, they've got um and grown and obviously i'd come in brand new like i was like this like smiley like yay and thinking why are people shouting at me like i'm lovely i was genuinely <laughs> like what is happening like i'm getting told off and running running down to cfbt containers because like i rolled my eyes that was a bad move didn't mean to but so i was like what is happening and there was on my course there was a lot of uh, guys and there was a, a couple of girls from another service because we did a dual one who mm. were older and had a bit of more experience and I was thinking is that the right way to have done it have I come in too early but I don't regret it and I didn't for, for, for me personally do you know a kind of spin-off for it I think one of the things post-covid but also just generationally just in general is I think more people now are feeling the freedom that if they don't enjoy the thing they do they are not suffering as much from that investment bias I think historically people that have gone into a different sector, a different profession at 18, 19, 20, whatever it might be, have gone, <clears throat> well, I've got these five cards from my education. These are my cards that I can go out to the world and exchange them for value. And I yes, can yes. be a builder. I can <laughs> be an accountant. I can be a teacher. Maybe I can be a thing. And then once they've done their thing for like five years, 10 years, all of a sudden they feel like I am a career accountant. Do you know what I mean? And then they're like, I've done 10 years doing this thing. I don't yeah. think I like it, but I've built a structure around my life that relies on me doing it. I've kind of set up my life with this income, with this thing. And people identify with me as this thing. Yeah. Whereas I feel now that there's a big sort of social media movement about, you know, breaking away and doing the thing you really want to do, you know, not living with regrets, not having those, I wish I could have, wish I should have. Yeah, yeah. And I think oh. people in there, late yeah. 20s early 30s and 40s and even 50s you know what i mean we had we had a re recruit of 49 years of age last year wow cool People are going i've always wanted to do this thing and yeah. i think especially covid gave people that kind of tactical pause where for better or worse and irrespective of the economy people kind of paused spent a long time at home going do i want to go back to the thing yeah reflecting massively on yeah. yeah, I've got time now to actually process, whereas everyone was in, you was in a routine, 
day in, day out. You're in the fucking baggage. rat run. Fucking yeah, going for it. Course. Keep up with the goddamn treadmill. Yeah. Don't fall off. The kids need you. The family needs you. You've That's got to pay it. the bills. Get the point. Pay the mortgage. And it made you look at things very differently. Like you say, you when people work from and like it does give people that time to reflect and go, I don't know if I enjoy this anymore. Is this what I want? Yeah. And I also think back when we joined, it was a career for life. Yes. No one left the job. It was unheard of because who leaves the fire service? This is an amazing career yeah. for life. Now, people don't bat an eyelid at, oh, it's, you hear it most weeks. So-and-so's left. They might go to a different service, but so not always. So-and-so's left to go there. They've gone to do that because, but like you said. I think that's okay sometimes as well. I mean, it's horrible if they've been in two years and they decide to leave. Yeah, thanks for the training. <laughs> the, the other thing is, like, if people left their accounting job or something like that, in order to do it, some people framed it like, if I leave, everybody will know I wasn't happy. Or I'll have to admit I made a mistake. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't I don't think that's the case because you're a different person than you were when you were 20. You know what yeah, I mean? I, I remember going to work at factories and I remember going to work on a building site and I loved it for a bit. Yes. And then I didn't love it anymore. That doesn't mean I made a mistake. It doesn't mean I've done similar businesses. Done. You know, I've, I've built businesses up and they've turned over some great money and then I've gone, I don't enjoy this anymore. Yeah. And nothing that, that's has okay. to be forever, does it? Nothing has to be forever. No. Everything's a stepping stone to where we end up. And it's that's fine. so what if it was a year or two years, like you said, it had the, it had its relevance and its input <laughs> at the time. And it is okay. It, it is okay for to think, actually, I want to change. Good for that person, good for you. Because is it not worse to go wanted to leave five years ago, but I didn't, and I'm so unhappy. What you're unhappy in where you spend most of your life. Yeah. If it served its purpose and you want more, go get it. Like absolutely, I always use my daughter as an example for this because she's uh, in year six at the minute and oh, she's moving up okay. to high school. She's our youngest of three, and uh, I say Lily's just in year six. She loved it. Her teacher, oh, she would just talk about her nonstop. She's fucking amazing. She's this. She's actually wouldn't swear, but you know, she's, like, she's an amazing <laughs> yeah. teacher. She loves year six, yeah, but yeah. now she's grown. She's grown, she's developed her expectations of herself, her desire to do different things. So she's going to move up to year seven and she's going to go. Yeah. I know people are like, oh yeah, shut up, Peter. It's obvious she's a kid. It doesn't change when you get older. Yeah. We're so conditioned with this. My formal education has finished. I'm 18, I'm 21, I'm 17, whatever I am. And people go, my education is finished now. No, 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 no. The fixed structure that we in the Western world have set up of your formal education. But now... The scaffoldings come away, so you can go away and educate yourself in whatever you yeah. want. You want to go to Borneo and do the thing. You want to go to London and be a surveyor. You want to go to the Highlands and, and be a park ranger. Whatever you want to do. You want to yeah. trap yourself in the attic and paint. Do it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That, that for some people is really difficult because they feel like I've gotten to a different point in my life and now I want something different. And there's also a great book I speak about sometimes on the podcast called The Second Mountain. Have you ever heard of it? I heard you talk about it. <laughs> I mentioned it too much. I need to read some other books, but I really enjoyed it. And it's like, I thought I'm going to look into it. And I actually looked at it about it on Audible. So that's going to be the next one. Yeah. The guy's okay reading it. Again, talking about presentations, you've got it. The the people that read audio books or podcasts, you've got to, the voice has got to make sense to you. Otherwise, you're like, oh, I can't listen to six hours of this shit. And go, don't like this voice. And I'm like, oh, I really wanted to read this book. Yeah, no, because you're like, oh, the book looked interesting. But you're like, yeah. oh. But anyway. No, because I've currently got that, the the one that you we talked about, uh, the neurodiversity one. I'm still uh, listening to that one. I think different. Um, uh, differently Wired. Differently Wired. That yeah. is a great book. Yeah, I mean, that one, I'll just bring it up on my phone again. because I, I want know, we've jumped to, to something. Go. That we've no, bought. no, we're not. We're jumping all other places. Differently Wired is by Deborah Reba. Yes, um, and she really obviously reads it, she narrates it, which is perfect because yeah. you get that authenticity to see and the yeah, relationship. Yeah, and... yeah, I think a couple of chapters in again at the minute, it's uh, talking about a daughter still in a few different variations, but we'll go, we'll go there in a minute. But yeah, the yes. second mountain aspect is like, you want you really want to do this thing, you've climbed to the top of that mountain yeah. and now you can see other stuff. Yes. Yeah, you've become a competent firefighter in the fire service and yeah. you look over and go, hey, oh, there's some fire investigation over there. Hey, oh, there's a police commissioner role to do this in yeah, the public. Yeah. Absolutely. Go and do it. But, but you I have to have the humility to descend from where you are yeah. and go, I'm going to go on another adventure now. And everyone else is sat at the top of the mountain in the accountancy firm going, what are you leaving for? We fucking yeah. spent ages climbing up here. Yes. You, you, you're such a great accountant. And you're like, I know, but 
Oh, that what, thing what? over there teaching water rafting looks really fun. And I'm going yeah. to go and learn how to do that now. And but, that's the thing. It's it's like you said, again, we'll go back to when people join, oh, I'm going to be a career firefighter. For 12 years, I honestly thought I was going to do that. What's wrong yeah. with it? It's an amazing job. Like, this is what I wanted to do. I did it. I'm here. Sold. 100%. However, it literally a switch changed. And now, now the switch has happened, though. I'm always wanting more. Like, oh, can I go on this instructor course? Can I go on this? What what's the next step? Next step because that's just me all over. Like yeah. there's the mountain. Oh, there's the next one. There's the next one. And I think that's all right. Like why Healthy. why want to grow? Yeah. Like and want to learn more. I just each to their own. Like you say, people want to stay at the top of that mountain. Fine, but then it's all right to think that served its purpose. That's the next one. Right, I'm after, yeah. I'm coming for you. It's just a neurological difference. You you just yeah. engage. It doesn't mean you're a better student. It just means you have a, a sensation, a desire to go off and, and learn and yeah. do new stuff. That is also a bit of a, a, a torture sometimes. You know, people, some people, we aggrandize that and like say it's an amazing thing or you always want to do more stuff. But actually, it can also be quite torturous yeah. because you have to leave people behind all the time. You know, you yeah. move stations, move watches, you move businesses, you close things down, you start things up. Yeah. Like I've had amazing podcast episodes of people who I'd love to spend more time with. I haven't spoke to them in four years. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, that's just life. And you'll have an amazing interaction with amazing people that you work with, and then you'll move on and do something else. Uh, yeah. And that's okay. But take us back up from the, from the <laughs> rabbit hole of the, all these new people that are coming into the services and how that gives us a different landscape to navigate it gives us a different customer to to facilitate and and yes. the success i suppose <clears throat> so now i think we have got like say the younger i do think that like i look out at the 24 recruits we've currently got going through a training course and they all are very there's say majority of them are young there's a couple that are really really young mm. um and then there's some that have had that like you say like i said that i got on my course where they've been in the military and they've served some time but you can yeah, tell they've got you a conditioning sort of thing. Yeah, they? you can tell some of the difference. But it's yeah. nice to see that they help the others out. Um, but I think because I was like, right, I know, and I'm quite transparent. I like to be quite human with the recruits. And I'm like, I didn't find my course easy. I don't mm. think we should go in and be like, I'm an instructor. I am the, the the most amazing person in the world. You'll do as I say. That's I don't know if it ever worked, Pete. <clears> if I'm honest, because I don't know what it was like. Like when we didn't first, capture no. the data of when it didn't work is the thing. We just said yeah. oh, oh, they couldn't cut the mustard or they weren't yeah. made of the right stuff, whatever yeah. that is. And <laughs> I am amazing. Like you've come here. I'll say jump. You'll say how high. Yeah. It was a bit militant when I joined, but I think there was a lot of it before me. There was bits and bobs, but we have, whether it's right or like good or bad, softened and softened and softened. And that is the way it's gone. Culture, HR, however you want to play it, it has softened a lot. Mm -hmm. You can't do certain things. We got, um, when I first joined into it, which was a bit of an eye-opener, HR were very much, you can't make them do that. They can't do pickets. You have to treat them like adults. And we was like, we are, we're trying to get them yeah. used to what it'll be like. And it's very, sometimes it's a bit of a battle. It is. It's, so, it's a thin line to, to walk and you have got to have yeah. strong characters and strong people in your department to kind of fend off the uh, some of the accidental wokeism that can get folded mm. into. And you're like, yeah, I always think of equity and equality as a great example. It's like equality is treating everybody fairly. Equity yes. is giving everybody the same opportunity. Yes. I If this person is like, if you gave everybody size one shoes because you want it to be fair well i've got size 13 feet so i'm then we go off and run a race i'm really going to struggle to run that race with you because i'm in a lot of pain because you haven't given me you think you're giving me the same resources because you go give everybody a laptop give everybody size one shoes and you go yeah but that person's different they do want to do the thing and they can do the thing but they need an, an adaptation in this thing you call equality you need Which to bring again, everybody up to the same start line. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, oh, we'll Which just prep yourself and pull up your bootstraps. What if they're going to fucking bootstraps? What if they're going to yeah. fucking boots? Do you know what I mean? You need to yeah. get them all on the start line with the same mindset. And I always think about this with some of the female firefighters that we get in. They, they always listen more. They only have to tell them one or two times usually because – They've had to usually, in my, and please help me understand if it's different for yourself, but like they've usually had to try a lot harder to even get to the start line. Yeah. They've had to focus more because they've not been part of the all the thousands of conversations about 
you know, male ideas of firemanship and stuff like that. Yeah, so they've got yeah. less familiarity with the sector. It looks like a really interesting thing, but they've their their learning curve starts like six months before they apply before they even get there most men yeah. sometimes they wander onto you know job related tests or have a go days and they're like yeah my dad was a mechanic so i'll be able to do the dexterity thing and you're yes. like you're not fucking listening to the instructions so you've just yeah. failed and they're like but i know what i'm doing but you didn't listen to the instructions and sometimes yeah. we get female firefighters they're really listening they're yeah, like, yeah. can I, can I, can I just have another look at the notes? You have another look at the notes. I'm going to leave them there in front of you so you can refer to them as we go yes, through if you want yeah, to. Yeah. And they fucking get it right because yeah. they're listening. They're switching on. Do you know what exactly, I mean? Yeah, yeah no, it is, it's right. And that that links, obviously, what you've just said again into the neurodiversity that we keep dipping in now because you can just go, right, 24 of you, you're here, and this is what we're going to learn, this is how we're going to teach it. And then when yeah. we have ones that struggle or you're thinking, why don't they look like they're listening? Why are they not doing this? Why are they not receiving the information I'm giving in the in the same way everyone else is? And then we'd go, again, historically, maybe, oh, well, they're just not listening. Oh, they don't cut the mustard. That, that yeah. terminology again. Actually, no. No, no, no. Let's not be like that. What is it? And then you find out maybe they've uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia. There's other things there. Mm. And they are listening they're just not looking because they're making notes or they're drawing pictures to relate. So let's not be very closed minded about it and let's be open to, is there any way we can make that better for you? Because they are being receptive. We're just being very small minded about it and thinking, well, I can learn that. Like that's how I learn it. Yeah, but that's not how everyone learns. No. And I mean, you and I were probably born in the mid to late eighties in the same time. A neurodiversity movement only kind of emerged during the 1990s, I mean, I've got something from the um, Harvard Health Publishing. I think we both looked at it before we came on, the Harvard Medical School aspects of it. And when they talk in there about, like, what is neurodiversity, for a lot of us, we think of it as, as differences. But differences aren't always deficits. It's knowing that the world around all of us, we experience and interact with it in very different ways. Yeah. It's like standing at different sides of a cube, isn't it? And there's no one right way of thinking. But the word neurodiversity refers to not just the diversity of people, but also it's it's often referred to with things like um, ADHD or, or autism yes. spectrum disorders and, yeah. and the neurological development of conditions like ADHD and learning disabilities. That all kind of came around in the 90s. And the whole aim was to like increase the, the, the knowledge and acceptance and inclusion of people that have different neurological differences. The words matter in neurodiversity. So neurodiversity advocates and encourages inclusion and non-judgmental language, which sounds very corporate -y. but things like a person with autism or a person with down syndrome yeah. some research has found that the majority of autistic community pre prefers to be identified in their first language as an autistic person which is absolutely yeah. fine but they have mm -hmm. different knowledge bases and different ways of thinking about things and we make assumptions and address people like that um sometimes with disrespectful language and sometimes make assumptions that they're going to struggle yes with doing the task but it's just we have to vary the way in which we deliver it and the tools in which we're we sort of leverage to help get that person on board. And and we'll go into <clears throat> different learning styles. I know we will in a minute and about like that acquisition of skills and the different ways in which we can deliver it. But we have a whole host of people now with different learning styles. And somebody that lives in an accountancy world, again, I use that as an example, or a data researcher or an analyst, if somebody did lean somewhere on that um, autism spectrum disorder, they would excel in something like that. Yes. And oh, they can absolutely. excel in the fire service as well. But we just have to think about the way they assimilate that knowledge and the stages of which are required to, to try and implement it and kind of encode it into our heads, I suppose. Well, that's it. Like uh, one of my close friends, uh, her son uh, is autistic. Um, they're so clever. Like mm. better his, his maths is incredible. Like I'm like, wow. But he's like, say, around people. Is, is is when it is social, he gets social social anxiety sorry and he struggles with communication and like if he gets frustrated and things like that but like say in some worlds like how clever he is just excel yeah um, but it's then like you say people i think just going i think sometimes people are unsure how to be mm. around or, or how to um how to interact it's a, stigma. I think it's, it's a lack of awareness yeah, it's a stigma, isn't, it? isn't it and it's just yeah. that's <clears> it it's massively that the lack of awareness because i think the more we look into it which we me we've both done because we've talked mm. about it and the audio book that we've uh, the different one both listening to you go yeah never really thought about that mm. never really saw it that way and go and like 
oh yeah like some of the things that again i'm digressing but the the author talks about in the neurodiversity book when she says that about different things that have taken place and people could just foresee it as they're just causing trouble or why they're reacting or acting out is probably a better terminology yes. it like that. We and think they're deliberately is, being disruptive or yeah, they're deliberately being rude. Yeah. Or they, when you ask them, I'm like, oh, no, I can't believe you did that. And or, But yeah. what was you trying to do? Oh, I was, just, I was just trying to do that. And you go, yeah, I've probably been built guilty of thinking, really don't understand that. That's just bad behaviour or something like that. And I think... Sometimes, like, I think, God, I think I'm open-minded and it's just not knowing, like you say, the lack of awareness. But when you look into it, you think, mm. wow. Yeah. And it is, we need to be, especially for us as instructors, um, and having now, and I think it will just continue, Pete, if I'm honest, we mm. will have this more and more. We need to step back and be like, how can we be You've got to want to learn it, though. You've got to, yeah, you've got to be lean into part of the conversation, yeah. not just giving it... Because some people frame it in like that woke language and, and it bleeds over into other aspects as well because people hear EDI, some people immediately switch off. But it's because they think, are oh, you talking about racism? Are you talking about sexism? Well, sometimes, yeah, we are. But sometimes as well, it's so much wider. Well, always, it's so much wider than that. And it's yeah. just about managing adjustments and making like workplaces, especially, especially training development, more mm -hmm. like neurodiversity friendly. Like I've started to send in packs of information to recruits three or four weeks ahead of them starting the course. Yes. Some people are like, well, what if they go down the station and, and fall off? A th a th they're not going to do the thing. Yeah. They're just going to yeah. look at it, read it, you know, watch some of these videos if they want to, because giving people, you know, forward knowledge about yes. changes to plans and you know, just allowing for those reasonable changes. And then even once they're in the classroom, you know, some of these people are far more tactile than they ever used to be. So allow for modification. You, know, you haven't got to sit there in your shirt all the time. You might want people to parade in their uniform, yes. but you don't have to sit there because some people, that will be a barrier to them being able to, because they've got this frustration. They've got this physical discomfort. And there's a spectrum I appreciate. We're not going to turn the world upside down just to facilitate this one person. But, you know, allowing for, for fidget toys or movement breaks or, yeah. or flexible seating for certain people, you know, communication styles. Some people were big on banter in the fire service, but euphemisms and implied messages and sarcasms can sometimes be lost or misinterpreted on people yeah. with different neurodiversities. As long as they understand that it's part of the context of the emergency services, they can then start to delineate between yeah. the two. But you've got to you've got to be able to have that conversation, not just make it an assumption, because these people aren't being deliberately rude. No. Or they're not trying to break any rules. But you've got to give like that advanced notice and, and don't make assumptions from people's preferences, needs, or their own particular goals. And it's small adjustments, really, just then when you was talking, yeah. like there were relax your shirts, or like you say, just allowing more time for exams if they need it. Um and let's say the fidget toys or just anything. It's, it's really little things from our yeah. point of view that can make big differences to those individuals and their learning. Yeah, huge. And I think it's brilliant that we can learn more and there is, it is out there. We just need to, like you say, we want, we need, the want has to be there though. Cause me and you didn't have to listen to that audio book. No, but that's it. Yeah. People think this feel. needs to be prescribed to them. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, there's no real uh, course for me to go on at the minute. So yeah, I yeah, been made oh, something what, that we need you to looking? do. Are you looking at yourself? Are you are you wandering out into the forest and bringing back little nuggets? You know, I send my team and you know, crew managers and stuff like that. Different things to look at, different things to read. Some of them read them, some of them don't. Yeah. Some of them will message me back and go, oh, yeah, I saw this thing in the thing and it reminded me of X student. And I'm like, yeah, it's a great shout. I mean, what's the low hanging fruit there? Is there anything you think we could do? Anything you think we'd adopt? You know, and they'll send me stuff. Some people will, will start finding it. And it's just, it might be a two minute TED talk. You know, it might be a, a one page Word document, which we can just throw up on a board and talk about. And and yeah. even if we're just making a half a percent pivot or we're just doing a one percent change, that's going to be colossal for, for certain students. Yes, oh, absolutely. So when we've got all these new students coming in, we're heading into training development. It is like a freaking bombardment of stuff nonstop. You're trying to great learning is taking somebody from what they know to what they don't know. And sometimes the chasm in the emergency services is is colossal. You know, some people have come from the military, it'd be easier for them. But even for them, we've got a lot of written content. We've got a lot of exams still certain places. We've got a lot of stuff they need to go into. So I know you've kind of gone out into the woods again and brought back some nuggets and found some of those best ideas or ways of improving or processing and retaining some of that information. Yeah, so I did have a like, deep delve of different, different things because I personally, I'm not the best 
at studying things either. Um, sometimes it just doesn't mm. the processing and the retention, which is obviously what we're, what I'm going to like delve into a little bit. It, it is the um, both parts like being able to process that information that we get given to and in the fire service predominantly, as we've said, the recruits course that me and you briefly talked about before mm. the podcast. It's a long old slog, 12, 14 weeks. And also it's that. Long slog, that is. Yeah, it is for people, especially like if it's not something you're used to again, um, not in a well, bad just way. A bit, it's but... everywhere though. It's a physical and the mental. It's just, it can just, it's very, very, very tiring. There's a colossal amount of stress that you take on board. And I don't think some people give enough mental bandwidth to what this is really going to require. If you don't know, it's like you don't know what you don't know, that classic, because you don't. Yeah. Like, you're like, I want to be in the fire service, brilliant. I've made it. I'm signing myself up for 40, this 14-week recruit course. And we talk to him at the beginning and we say, literally, you have to make sure. Well, we have actually family. We have like a family familiarization day. So, family... Oh, God, we should do that. We so, don't do that. Right, so I got done it in my previous service. This one, I was like, what's this about? So basically, we do a familiarization day for recruits. Uh, we had 24 recruits, so we split it into two days. So we had where they would come in and it was a practical familiarization day. So we would... They'd do bits and bobs of things that they would do on the course. We would they'd put um, a set on the back. We didn't put them under air because, again, we hadn't been there with that yet. But they'd put a set on and run around the yard and with the equipment and up and down the tower to get a real appreciation of how we will, excuse me, but put them through their paces and get an appreciation of what the kit feels like because it is restrictive. It's hot. It does its job. It keeps the bad stuff out, but it also keeps the heat in. It affects that that uh, moment of our body, that regulation. And no one who trained who's ever put fire kit on and been like, I'll just run around. No one. Yeah. Well, we we want to do it. You've done it. I want to do it. It's weird, but and it gives them that appreciation. The helmet's a game changer. That's ridiculous. The boots. Yeah. So we do we do a day and they come in and it's I think it does kind of change their mindset because I've had conversations with some at the end. Bear in mind, this is a month before they actually start their course and they go. That was tough. The live identify, they struggled with the, th- the uh, sorry, the cardio side of it or the strength. So I'm like, that's brilliant. Some people that are, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried or I've let myself down. No, you haven't. This is why we do it. We've got a month now. So go away, work on it. But do you bring a member of the family? You sort of family familiarization. Sorry, so that as well, we have a, like, it's like an evening. Sorry, I call it parents' evening, which is yeah. not, it's like, like, but I called it that. I tend to have my own terminology for a lot of things. But yeah, yeah. basically on an evening, it was, I think it was like two hours, um, the family, significant others, whatever it is, come in and the chief does a big talk about what they're coming into and what it's going to be like. And he gives, it's just exposing what, I wouldn't yeah. invite the chief. With all yeah, due respect to your chief, because I'd be like, he's going to talk about, he might talk about some good stuff, but you really right want it from there. the training instructor, because they might, they're going to refer to, they're going to say, oh yeah, my, my watch manager is Sarah, my crew manager is this, whoever is whoever. And I would almost feel, I prefer it from them, but sorry, I interrupted you. But anyway, yeah, they come in right. and they talk about. <clears throat> well, he does his bit, just because it's, I don't know, it's the way we go. And to be fair, yeah. it's a nice little bit that he does. And I think yeah. they like it, but so basically, it's just to kind of say this is what it'll entail and how draining. It's not just going to be on the individuals on the course, but on you guys. When they come home at the end of the at the end of the day, at the end of the week, they're going to be zapped. It's going to be stressful for you, especially if you've got like young children. So it's giving them that exposure and not saying that people are naive, but you don't know again what you don't know. So they don't know how much it's going to affect their wife, their husband, their, their children. So we give them that. We kind of say, be prepared for it. They need to kind of sell themselves sell the soul for the 14 weeks but we, they need your support yeah. and as well and then we kind of take the recruits away to do bits and bobs but we also let the um the family and friends ask questions um is there anything that you've got concerns about for this 14 weeks is there anything you want to know like they'll make you feel a bit more secure i don't know a bit more at ease about this because some of them obviously it's their 18 year old daughter or son that's never done anything like this before mm-hmm. um and then we basically give them a little bit of a tour of the of the center of the training center and everything and i liked it i was like this is new to me um i'm, gonna the that. I'm taking that away with us that's fine you oh, just, my that. mind's just been going like trim welfare like supporting your partner stress wash loads and decon because at some point they're going to yeah, be coming yeah. home and like just little things you know study tips how to support Make each other being more understanding yeah, and also giving them a contact if yeah. they if they want yeah. to reach out. Yeah, 
and say, look, I, I think I think my wife's struggling or I think my son's struggling yeah. or I think my dad, my partner, my husband, yeah. whatever. It's massively beneficial. And I thought, well, I like this. And I'd not been a part of that before. So then to come and then see it happen and like say it was, it was good. And I think as well what it does is it's the recruits have then come to headquarters. They've met the instructors because we was like the majority of us was there. We get all the little bits to find out as well. I know it sounds daft, but is there anything that you need? Is there anything you haven't got? Because the first day is so stressful. Like I was so stressed on my first day. The anything we can sort out and iron out, because I think we do it the week before that. So familiarization day is a month before. The parents' evening is maybe the week or so before. It's just, I don't know, it puts people a bit more at ease. And if we can do that, why not? So, yeah, so we do that. And I think I think that's brilliant. So I went off on a bit one there, didn't I? Just no, no, 100%. Go. I, I forced you to go off there because it's something but we I liked, yeah, I did. So, yeah, so basically we put a lot on them for that 14 weeks, don't we? So, and it is a lot to process as well as retain because we give them it and then we go, you've got an exam next week on that. And we do, we do pumping and ladders. You've got an ex- exam. We do BA or you've got practical exam. Yeah. You've got a written exam and the mind's just blown. We do building structures, tall buildings, the hazmats and they go, I'm like, how are you feeling? Cause we do uh, mentor meetings as well. So I'll get assigned to six of them and then the other four instructors. So we touch base weekly with them. How are you getting on? Now, it's nice just to go, right, this is a safer space now. We're away from the drill yard. Like, talk to me. I'm human. What's wrong? Like, what's going well? What's going bad? What can I do to help? And some of them will be like, the exams. We were nervous about the exam. I'm not very good theory-wise. Yeah, some people, I need I need you to read it to me. I need this. Yeah. I need that. Because after, you're not going to fucking sit an exam on a fire engine. You're not going to do it in the job. It is one method of just demonstrating your ability to recall you know, that self-referencing, you know, so tell us, you know, the mnemonics, you know, yeah. show us those retrieval cues that, you know, when you would do what and in what situation you would do this, you know, yeah. matching and sampling different things. But you're not going to be asked to do it in a written form when you're out there no. on the job. No, exactly. And there is a lot of things that we do and they look at us and you're thinking, and you're, you're thinking, I've, ne- I've never used this since I've been on stage yeah. can't say that. how is that going to get them engaging oh please can you do this exam learn these formulas for venturi effect and flow rates and how much do you lose if it's two two miles that way and it's um uh, three yeah. miles up, oh, like how much yeah. head of water and you go and then if they ask you like outright like ma'am do we uh how do you do we use this then and i'm thinking no oh, um well you might do because and so thinking, i'm I'm, oh, I'm in the process of separating a lot of that out so yeah. we're going to look at doing something again. As an example, with the with the Benui principles and stuff like that, we don't do that as part of the initial acquisition of skills. And even the okay. Venturi principles and certain things with the heads of pressures and pressure flows and atmospheric pressure and stuff like that, I'm trying to break a lot of that into like a pump champions course okay. and really understand what is part of initial acquisition of skills and what is something you will develop in as your career goes through. Because even once you pass out and you become a safe-to-ride firefighter, yeah. you aren't going to be asked to lead on certain things. We just want to make sure you can operate a pump proficiently and safely and not know what to do when something yeah. goes wrong. Know yeah. what to do when you're going to run out of water. Know what not to do to give an overpressure or you know to, to carry out a dangerous act. But if you can't you know, articulate to me the principles of the energy equation you know speed velocity flow pressure i don't care it's, it's okay it's not going to mean you're a bad fight a lot of firefighters couldn't do it but they're very great on the on the instagram yes that's it i think it's like that whole again you need to be just practically minded don't you and i think yeah. it's like when we do the tests with them and i think you've just learned a list or i've actually had recruits say to me oh what was that third one on that list and i'm like oh you just basically told me just you learned learned a list. A list. And I'm like, <laughs> so do you actually and then you'll question them about that particular thing like loss of water or like on the compound gauge those are where they're like oh you're questioning it and they don't know and i'm thinking so you don't understand you've just learned re- remembered a list and i'm like i don't we don't want that i just want them to have you a don't know the why them. behind it yeah so you wouldn't know what to go wrong yeah. so how could you put it right I, like you said i want them to we want them to be practical and it's if you can understand the fundamentals of why it's gone wrong or what um indicators are thinking something's not right here at least mm. You don't have to know exactly like like a lot a loss of a loss of pressure or things like that. And you have to think you know exactly, but what what things would you check at least? Like, oh, I'll have a look at that, or it could yeah. be the strain, or it could be yeah. That's collapse. when you're moving into that either like proactive interference, yeah. like disrupting that memory pattern, or even after they've consolidated on it, that 
retrospective interference of yeah. this is the way it went last time. We're going to throw something in the middle and see if you can match that stimulus to a sample memory of what you would do when it went wrong. So it's like trying to change the train's tracks mid journey and go right now, this has happened and it's heading left. What provisions do you need to put in place down the track to ensure yeah. it doesn't derail in this incident? What are you going to do now? And then they go, hmm. and then it's like, uh... oh, well, I don't usually do that. Cause usually I just, no, no, not usually this is live. Do what are you doing? What's going to yeah. happen now? Well, I don't know. Cause I'd usually do this. Because you just learnt the list, you've not. Stop saying usually. <laughs> yeah, stop. <laughs> stop saying that. Yeah, there's no usually. This is happening now. This went wrong. Well, that's not what's gone wrong. Like I'm like, but yeah, I just I couldn't help. You want to laugh, but it's not funny because it was an exam, like yeah. a test, a practical element. When they said, yeah. "Oh, what was the third thing on that list?" and I'm like, yeah. "Don't say that." Because that's are you asking me for the list for overdrawing a supply? No, yeah. I'm. I'm not having asking you for a list for anything. I'm saying no. this has happened. What do you want to do? Yeah, was that the one with three? <laughs> points on all four yeah. and i'm like oh you're stressing you do this is not working man. <laughs> they said we'll end it here but yeah like you said you, you if you could if they can understand what what's gone wrong or like you say they can at least identify it then yeah. what are the possible options that's all i want but like you said learning a list it's just a memory game isn't it and it, yeah. it's not kind of what we want we do want them to retain it but yeah so i love how much we can digress because clearly that shows we've got loads no, of that's it and it's perfect example so so I'd have like a bit delve into the World Wide Web about like say studying tips for improving like processing information and then retaining it because I think it is something that would be brilliant, a brilliant advantage to recruits for something that mm -hmm. like say all this information is not something they're used to processing, should I say. Mm -hmm. And so exercise, which I know sounds daft, but on looking into stuff, just doing like a bit of a walk or a little bit of a yes. jog to apparently get the blood flowing, mm -hmm. that prepares your body to improve cognitive function. And I was like, that's brilliant. It's why we remember words to songs, by the way. So like, I I went this. Have you ever been to any Tony Robbins stuff? People will roll their um, eyes. I feel they, like yeah. I'm one of them people who like know that song, don't know the artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Tony <laughs> no, Robbins is a personal development coach and he does these massive seminars. And within those, he puts in a lot of movement, a lot of getting up, a lot of walking around, a lot of changing okay. gears and the interact music and stuff like that because there is like levels of embedding things. And if I yes. just stand and talk to you about it, or if we sit down, I'm sorry, and talk about it. If we stand and talk about it, if we go for a walk and talk about it, if we go yeah. for a walk and talk about it to music, if I use my voice and my intonation. So the more physical cues and the more yes. physical engagement you can get when you're assimilating something, it like it like cuts the groove even deeper, doesn't it? It's like when you've got a song comes on and you go, I remember where I was at this yeah, and the links of that, I say yeah. emotions and things like that. But I think that's brilliant and very easy. To mm -hmm. kind of just like be like, oh, do, just like say a walk or a jog just to start mm -hmm. that brain flow. So I always do a what... bunch of press ups before I start a podcast. Do you really? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, cool. There's 63 in one go just before, I did, just before we did this chat because it gets my mind moving as well. And I, and you was, and we obviously everybody didn't see me, but I always do podcasts at a standing desk. So yes. we talk about adaptations in the workplace. Well, for students, we make them sit down behind a desk. Yeah. I get them to get up, go to the whiteboard, do this. Now we're going to sit there. Now we're going to get up again. I'm not like every two seconds. It's not, no, it's not fucking yeah. left foot in, left foot out, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. You know, but it's about how you prefer to learn. I think best when I'm stood up, when I'm on the phone, yes. I'm walking and talking. When I'm podcasting, I'm stood up. So exactly. So you are a prime example, you see, of of my point of one point one of like say the press ups thing, just doing something before you start something that you really want to be able to process well and retain so there you go look see you've done you do when, when people will walk into meeting rooms sometimes and if we've got five minutes before it starts i'll be on the floor stretching and they're like oh have you hurt your back and i'm like yeah, no, yeah. Is, i'm is doing the, this so i don't get hurt. i'm trying to stay supple yeah. i'm trying to stay flexible i i, I just yeah. stretch all the time and people think it's really weird and, yeah. I, and i'm like no i feel better now i feel limber in my mind we're not about to go for a run i'm not trying to impress anybody i'm, I'm not I don't, I don't do 63 press-ups in front of anybody else you know i'm just like yeah. I'm just, this is just, it helps me. Yeah, exactly. And, and I love that. That's brilliant. The second one then is making it relevant. So putting into practice things, so making it relate to things that you already know rather than just something totally alien to you. Yeah. And it's, this is it's not even fire service related, but when I was doing some CrossFit stuff at the box and I couldn't get my head around it, um, one of my coaches said, you know, when you're rowing, and I was like, oh, totally straight away I was engaged because yeah. I did 
I did rowing to quite a high level before I went to CrossFit. Mm-hmm. Um, so she knew straight away that I'd be so totally in because I love it. So I was like, oh, yeah, you've got my attention for, for starters. Mm-hmm. That, there we go. I was engaged straight away. Mm-hmm. And then she was like, when you're learning this type of movement, when you do, and she talked through a part of it and I went, Take oh, someone right, yeah. from what they know to what they don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? The start, but if you, you say to somebody, you know, when you get up in the morning and you switch to shower, it does this. Or when you're talking about pumping, who's ever drunk out of a straw? Yeah. And then you can start talking about creating a vacuum and positive and negative pressure and atmosphere and how that relates to you sucking a straw and getting fluid out of the glass. Yeah. I, yeah. It is lovely. To, like I say, that analogy of like you suck through the straw and the, the hard suction and the yeah. people. Go, what creates oh, yeah. how is How is the water coming up there? And let's just talk about that for a minute. What do you yeah. think's happening when you suck it through a straw? And it's good, like you say, it is good to do that. And or to, I do like breaking it down and making it very, you know, like with fire service, like it's simple. Firefighters, we like easy, simple, straightforward, and we do like. And yeah. I do. We was talking about this with the recruits because they've started doing uh, the trauma phase, yeah. and some of the terminology and they're like, "Oh, it's blowing our minds." I'm like, "Yeah, I get that," because I just talk very simple, like. Um, if they've got like a rice crispy chest, well, get air pockets and stuff like that. Rather than the the like the actual the alveoli inside the bronchioles inside the thing, and you're like, what? And like you said, if you can then relate it to something, firstly that they're interested in because you've got them engaged, yeah. and you can make it relevant or like say click it to so you see it on things all the time, like the cheesy films on TV or something. They'll like be this pro basketball player, like is is such a jock and is like struggling with his studies. And then this pretty girl who whatever, yeah, then like, you teach me this, and she's like, all oh, right, we'll do it. We'll link it to basketball or a three throws and that analogy, and then he'll learn it. I know it's a very cheesy rom coms, but they'll no, learn it. it's the not. You the make same. it cheesy for yourself. I but do the principles it. and the fundamentals are there, aren't they? You've got to tap into what interests people, and mm. because then they're engaged, and then they're like, "Oh!" And it, the penny drops. You see yeah. it all the time. Make it relevant. Link it to something that works for you, or don't feel like it has to be one size. Again, like we've said before, one size fits all. Let's mm-hmm. make it work for you. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. So I think that's that is really important. And like I say, you see it happen all the time. So it clearly is a, a tried and, and tested method. And then, so uh, making your mind work, there's, that's another point as well about just getting yourself pro- deeper processing. So do different things to to test your mind. If you write stuff down all the time. I think it was Marilyn Monroe who said, think in ink. And what I mean by that is it forces you not just to hear it or see it, but then when you write it down, yes. you see it again. And, and there's almost like a natural process of you are the one creating that information. Even if you yes. just said to me, gave me directions to the shops and I wrote them down. Yes. I'm having to process yeah, and that. regurgitate that information yeah. in written form. And as I write it, I see it again. And yes. I see it coming from me. Yeah. And it's, it, yeah, it, it 100%. Does, it just compounds that learning, yeah, doesn't that it? Yeah, that whole cognition and recall, yeah. because I've had to think about it, write it, and, and recall it to write it down. Because you said, right, you turn left at the end of the street. My mind's gone to turn left at the end of the street and repeat it to myself to write it down. Yeah. So it does, it just enforces, like say, yeah. that process of learning and again, retaining it because it's almost the repetition because mm. someone said it, you've heard it, you've processed it, digested it enough to then put it down on the paper. So the reason I always give um, printouts for the PowerPoint so people can make notes against every slide if they want to or no notes or whatever. Do you know yeah, what I mean? But I leave, them, leave them space to write stuff and doodle. Yeah. This is yours. Do whatever you want with it. And again, we was in a whole, oh, shit, like there's been different instructors obviously have different ways, but again, it's like, oh, if we give them the handouts, then they're going to be looking at the handouts and not what we're teaching and what if we are saying things or doing things. And I was like, no, I said, I get that. But I said, I loved having notes because if the instructor said something, I it might not be in the notes, so I'd write it down. Yes. Or they'd tell me something, again, going back to that, or making it relevant. I can circle relevant. it, and I can highlight yeah. it, or I can and whatever. I can the circles, or mm. like arrows to it, or if they said something, or compared it to something, I was like, oh, I love that, I'd write it down. So we do that now. We mm. put it on the tablets that we give them, so they can oh, do that. Oh, we've, we've got tablets, but they're not working yet. Yeah, but oh, I don't. Think that's going to be a game changer. Mine won't log in, mine won't log in, like, and I'm like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> technology for you yeah. so they've all got them on the tablet so they can read them prior to if the one um they've got them there to go through but also the tangibleness the handouts they're like it's there for them like you say to make notes and then we people who learn differently like the mm. like the ones that are, are, need that paper some people you give them a tablet at 45 years of age 50 years of age they'll go oh you're all right i'll just listen 
It's not because they don't want to use it. It's because they're they're showing a bit of in uh, vulnerability there. They're like, I'm not really a techie guy. I don't. Uh, and that's I, fine. I really it's like listen, then they'll just think, all oh, right, great, yes. Oh, yeah. That's I'll tell you what, mate. Well, here's the notes anyway. You put that to one side if you want to. Don't worry about yeah. it. You've got I'm not it. saying, well, no, actually, every recruit has to do this, so you're going to need to do it, and we'll wait for you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. Okay, We've so got... now the whole group is going to stare at this person whilst they try and work something that never worked before. I know, yeah. And then it's just like, say, hi, it's a stress, like, yeah. all yeah. eyes on me. No, that's fine. Use a tablet, use the handout, or just watch us and retain that information. Everyone mm-hmm. learns differently. You you do you. Yeah. All we want is like you to learn and be able to process it. Mm. So I do like that. And some of the recruits want get in some of the process we was doing. And I was like, make lists, do the cue cards. We give them all a pack of cue cards when they start, like talk to each other because they might be able to. It's like that whole when you do knots and lines. Yeah. I might teach it one way. Another instructor will teach it another. But you find your way and what works for you. Yeah. Do vine dumps. Do, put the word in the middle and then like what it relates to or for BA, for example, I was like, you know what we're looking for, write it in the middle and then brainstorm off it. What that means for you. Like if we're looking at good self-protection, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Like write it down, do yeah. it, do it practically, write it down, whatever it takes for you to retain that, do it. That's that one. What we've got, we've got also the classic one of good night's sleep. I mm-hmm. preach about this, but I'm rubbish for it because there's not enough hours in the day. So I never get enough sleep and my whoop band hates me for it. I think I got 12% recovery last night. How is that even possible? <laughs> well, I did. Um, yeah, good night's sleep. I'd like to say sleep deprivation. It, it, I don't know if it is overlooked. I think it still is. I still massively think overlooked. We, well, we used to epitomize the whole sleep is the cousin of death and, you know, work till my eyes bleed. And yeah. Margaret Thatcher used to go four hours a night of sleep and all the top CEOs never sleep. But now we've really started shifting more to, and it's been a big thing for me, you know, like, Sleep is a secret superpower. It's a massive yeah, yeah. performance enhancer. I really protect it now. Yeah, and I think it is. And like I say, I do preach it, but I'm not very good at it. Like I like to the recruits, make sure you rest over the weekend. We've got BA phase starting on Monday. And I don't I do not do it, but I'm trying and that's all I can have. I, I say I am trying, but... It's a big game changer, different. honestly. As you get older, it's even more and more and more important. I know, especially when I'm trying to have conversations like this and I'm trying to yeah. you know, podcast about, I need, I need a good night's sleep. My mind needs to be present. It well, that's have it. that and lag it, and that fog. You do. And for yeah. them, and like say for recruits, we need them. We need their A game for them and for us. Mm. Like we want them to feel their best If and we need them to be okay the next day. So if they're flagging Monday, what they're going to be like Thursday, Friday. So that good night's sleep and also getting into a nice routine where you are relaxed. I know we ask a lot from them and we give them stuff and they're thinking, I need to revise for the test. But input, it's important as well that they do like wind down they get a good night's sleep and they don't just think yeah but i need to revise till 10 11 o'clock at night but then i'll get up at five um and then go over my notes again we want the best from you but you also have to look after yourself because it will have a knock-on domino effect plus it also embeds it better i mean there was that study i think it's on the document that we've got there it's that psychological science study in 2016 that compared two groups of students who studied the same material over two study sessions each had 12 hours apart. One group studied at night, slept, and then studied again in the morning. While the other group studied in the morning and again before going to sleep. Whereas the group who slept between the study sessions had better recall and quicker learning times than those who didn't. So that shows that breaking that up and allowing your mind to just rest and embed that knowledge and, and sort of finish off its encoding process of, of I've onboarded this thing and now I'm going to let it settle in. I'm going to let it sit rather than just saying i'm going to study until 11 at night once once it's in there sometimes you need to just let it sit and settle you can yep. almost continue to heighten your stress if you're thinking i need to go over it again i need to go over it again i feel like i'm not getting it because yep. that that can be a self-perpetuating negative cycle that like spirals yep, exactly. down into it's almost like practice to failure you know yes. keep doing it, and then you start getting it wrong and then you panic and then, and then you keep doing open. it and you see that with like ladder pitches all the time you're like we're going to do it four or five times well, then we're going to stop. I'm not going to keep doing yeah. it until you've, if you've done it well, all of you have rotated around, you've done it well, let's move on. And then we'll touch it again in a few days. Oh, time. Yeah, it's like if they've had an epic fail, like ladders is one that I I do kind of dread, which is it's always awful. squeaky yeah. bum time, isn't it? Yeah, but it's just, especially the 13 and a half confined. I'm like on a wind, not windy oh, day. God. We obviously yeah. do our risk assessments, but you, if it's, even if it's a bit windy, you think, oh God, this is new to them. Like it, yeah. it's very, we call it, like say, the confused pitch for a reason. Yeah. 
Like we've um, recently stripped two layers of uh, thirteen five off. So okay. if you've got, so then you've just got the bottom section of the ladder with the jack beams and the poles on it, mm. so they can get used to that underrun. Um, oh, that's cool. Under cool idea. Built on. If yeah. I ask you, service if they've got an old ladder, get yeah. them to take the two extending sections off it, just yeah. so you can run through that confusing tilt. You know, yes. it's like, okay, now three moves to here, tilt four moves to there, the... tilt on this. And then you go, bollocks, keep it straight. Oh, yeah. God, wait, look at the top, get, blah, get blah, blah. vertical. Like, how many times do you shout that? I think I hear that in my sleep. Get it to so vertical. You can just get them into that scary bit. And that is very forgiving. It's very, yeah. Obviously, it's, it's yeah. over a third, um, or a third as light as the other one. So yeah, like yeah, you for say any services it. out there, if they've got an old, an old one that's going out of date somewhere, or the line's damaged on it, don't yeah. throw it away. Get your stores and workshops or whoever it is you refer to. Get them to just rip those top two layers off, and then just put it in back of the base somewhere, and then use yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. That. It's been a game changer for us. Yeah, no, like you say, it's just less daunting as well, isn't it, for them? And yep. because, yep. like you say, if you get in your own head, you've lost half the game anyway. And they oh, do yeah. when they see the size of that ladder or pick part of it up. They're in their heads walking to where they're pitching it, thinking, "No, no, no. it's not going to go. Right it's not going to work." <laughs> that's it. But just linking back to what you said, actually, it's one of the points on the whole process and the retention is knowing when to move on as well, which yeah. you literally went into then. It is like, oh, know when to set the break. Yeah. Or know when to move on. Like, you could think there's 10 things here I don't know. Whoa, whoa, don't do that. There's one thing you don't know at this point. So do that one thing. Learn that. Don't overwhelm yourself. Or, but also, like you said, if, if it's not going in, why is it not going in? Do you just need yeah. to go... I maybe need to take a break or like you say come back to this tomorrow because you get in that spiral we all we've all done it where we're like i don't know it i don't know it i can't remember it yeah because let's have a look it's 10 o'clock at night it's a thursday so you've been doing long ass days at training school and yeah. your bollocks like you're knackered like in your head's yeah. like i want sleep so give it what it needs because they'll be thankful for it so know when to take a break don't just like you say just hammer it in and just you're not doing yourself any favors, but it's it is hard because you think we just we just totally see it as the more time we put into it, the more I read it. If I'm working from five till ten on it, I'm definitely going to be better. And actually, it's probably not true. Yeah. Well, it's not true, is it? But it's no. it's that simple way of seeing it. But it's five hours of input I've done. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is it? <laughs> And then you still that self doubt spiral. Oh, maybe I'm just stupid. You know, maybe everyone's right. Maybe I just can't do this. Maybe oh, everyone seems to be doing so well, and I feel like I'm the only one struggling. Yes, that a lot, don't you? On courses, as well, some of them I've spoke to are like lovely, and I think, oh, I want you to get it as well, and they just go, it's not going in, and I'm like, give it time. And obviously, I talk for all the things like do this, try this, try that, to try and give them other ways of looking at it. And one of like they have like some of them have got so many notes. I like, got this like little briefcase that carries all its, its files in it and I'm like oh but, <laughs> and I'm just like it's not easy it really isn't to like process all this information but just give yourself a break and I always say and it is again probably one of my cheesy little you know you are you're like lines at the beginning of a course mm. but I'm like you it's about attitude for me and it really is though I do yes. genuinely mean it PMA you baby, give everything, all day you gotta have that pause to make life you, gotta, so you give us everything we will give you 110% back yeah. because we don't expect you to get it just like mm -hmm. that. It's brand new stuff, but you've got to have the right attitude. And if you were putting in the work and you've got the one, I'll give you it back tenfold. 100%. And when you see that and they're not getting it, you really want it for them. And you think, what can I do better? Like, what can we do for them better? Because you just want them to get it so much. That's what great instructors do. You know, you do go some that go, uh, and it echoes back to that. They've just not got it. You know, I've, I've run these courses 500 times and uh, this person's just rubbish or whatever. And you're like, yeah. okay, but there's a relationship there. Like the learning is 100%. So you as an instructor are contributing 20, 30, 40. Sometimes you, yeah. need, to, you need to reach over. You need to actually not meet you halfway, as people like to yeah. say. No, I'm going to go 70%. Okay. Yeah. And I need you to come 30. And then slowly I'll start backing off yes. and you'll step more into it. And eventually yeah. you'll adopt the 100%. Yeah. But I've got to be willing to go maybe 90, 95% to start with, depending on where your framework is, depending on what you brought in with you from your own upbringing, from your own cultural diversity, from your own nature nurture. Yeah. You know, what did you bring with you? Maybe you only bought 5%. We can get you there. Yeah, because but your attitude is right. You I've got to be willing to yeah. go all the way down that spectrum and meet you at 95%. And then, like you say, it just gradually comes back. And it's the confidence thing, is it? If you show the belief in them yeah. and they're like, oh, 
oh, that instructor believes in me or they all believe in me. And then, oh, maybe I am then. Yes, you are. Like we, one of the recruits we've had really lacked confidence. And like, you've got to stop. Like, and but now I'll ask him, how are you doing? Yeah, it's going well. And I'm like, brilliant. Because before he was like, I don't know. I don't think yeah. I've done very well. You've got know. to believe Not great, yourself. was it? Why? What, 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 what's, what was not great about it? What does great look like? Well, I don't know, but. That's what, yeah, that's what it was. It no, was like on the line. You can't even articulate conflict. why you don't yeah. think it's great. That just seems to be your inner dialogue. That's, that's yeah. the backing let's track to your own yeah. actions. Well, I just went, well, let's ask the others. Do you? And there was like, oh, I think it went all right. And I'd be like, well, they think it went all right. And I went, I think it went all right. So I was like, you've got to start believing in yourself. I was like, take the wins. Yeah. I was like, so wins. have that self belief, but it's happened. And he's still on the course. And he now, when you ask him, you can even say he like stands up a bit taller and he'll be like, it's going well, thanks, mom. And I'm like, oh. And then I'll go off and in, run into the instructors and I'm like, oh, he's, he's getting there. Yeah. We're, we're winning. We're winning. And it's such and that. And that's why I love the courses. I, I do. I think for me, that's why I'm a training. That's why I'm in training because of them yeah. recruit courses, because that process, it's so cheesy, but it's priceless. And I, and I feel like a proud parent, like, because yeah. I'm like, yeah, you did this, like, and you you mm. stuck it out and you put everything in and we get, to, we get to be not only a part of it, but we get to see that progression and development. And I think it's priceless. I really do. 100%. Absolutely love that. I know we've got a whole host of things to, to get through, but people won't know it is a Sunday and I want to be super respectful of your time. I know you need to go and ice bath and stretch and, and, and get ready for next week as well. So know, yeah, people, yeah. Um, people that aren't familiar, we are going to do a couple more bits together. We are going to get in and go into some of the weeds because we get a bunch of emails and requests for specific stuff. So again, we are not the gods of any information whatsoever. We're just eternal students trying to go out there into the forest and find these nuggets. So we're going to try over the next couple of months or so to to maybe jump in together once a month or something and have some conversations about some of those principles some of them will be short ones short and sharp pointy some of them will be slightly layered and we'll mess it up and fumble and like i always say to people when you read a book if you take one idea from a book of 300 pages it was worth it you know if you come away from a podcast and go you know what 80 percent of that was dog shit for me but there was those three points you know what when sarah said that when pete did this when they spoke about that idea or you know i hadn't heard about that before or oh yeah even just that process of encoding or you know i'll tell you what yeah where is my sleep shit i don't know my sleep's not where i need it to be and maybe that is a game changer for me that's a blind spot and if you get that one thing if you get that one nugget at the forest yeah great the, the whole and that's all I want. It. Like, I just think, like you say, if I can do what your podcasts and, like you say, books and audio books that you listen to, like you say, just one or two things where people think, never even thought of that, that's great. I'll be like, yes, because I just think, I just want to be able to help, like yeah. things help me, that's all. We say that. People say, I'll oh, leave it better than you found it. Okay, then how oh, yeah, do you do? don't just brutal. do the same thing that was always done. If you really want to leave it better than you found it, you can't just go there, do the same that's always done. So, podcasting i always call it speaking into the void and learning yeah. out loud the two things well, that's I think it's about no change without change is there that's, that's it that. you've got to be willing to look a bit of a dick you've got to put yourself out there and go you know what i don't know everything but i think i'm going to try and help this i always try and speak in the way that would have helped me when i was first yes. but who would i have wanted to hear from who would i have wanted to learn and that's why i yeah. try and, and how would you have wanted out. it I mean, yeah well, it's simple and it's yeah, yeah. If everyone like goes, how... well, it's all in the books in the library and you go oh shit i thought you were gonna say that i hate reading books yeah i'm not i, I want books i'm interested in the, library, in the debriefs yeah. but i'm not gonna go and read that really confusing document yeah. on the government website well, can't you just kind of give now, me the good bits yeah podcasts are the way and because <clears> we do we've said it spend so much time in the car and it's just i find it's just dead time to me i get so bored in the car yeah, so yeah. if you can then have something to listen to that you take things from you find interesting you can engage with and relate to you go oh that's a lot more productive way of having a drive yep, i like this i'll do this more often and then you get excited about getting in the car on the way home because you're like oh i'm gonna go and listen to that thing on yeah. birds i'm gonna go listen to that podcast on fishing i'm gonna catch up with what's happening in music or artistry yeah. or firefighting or whatever the hell it is yeah. but it's a tool so in you the enjoy that commute that little bit more so you've yeah. made that what could have been a bit crappy part of your day, a yeah. bit more enjoyment. But yeah, it is good when you're like, oh, nearly home time, nearly podcasting. <laughs> I find myself getting to places and sitting in the car for another five minutes to finish the chapter of an audio book or to finish the yeah. uh, Joe Rogan's podcast or whatever the hell it might be. You know what I mean? And it's great. And you go yeah. in there and you tell everybody about the thing you just heard. 
So I love it. Yeah, cause, and then well, we do that, and this is genuine. Like the other day, someone came into the office, promised you this actually happened, and said, I was listening to the Five Hats podcast, uh, the one on decontamination, and it just made me smile because I was yeah, like, all right, I've yeah. had that. And some people don't even know it's me, and they use it as a frame when they refer to it as a thing. And I, and I, that's all I want it to be. I'm like, it's fuck all to do with me. It's not me. It's the people. It's Sarah. It's it's Dave. It's you know Dr. Paul uh, Paul Christensen or whoever it is. And I'm like, if you can just that person with all that knowledge, bring them into a place that can reach more people. Bang. I don't care if nobody ever remembers that I was even involved in this. But if they, I always say to you, I said yeah. at the beginning of the podcast, and it would be a great way to finish. It's like people will forget who you are. They forget what you did, but they remember how you made them feel. You know, and they'll remember what they took away from it. And that's the gift. That's it. Yeah, that's it. But the thing, amazing thing is that you probably don't give yourself credit for is that you create the platform and that environment and space for people to do it, which is why you're great. So you need to give yourself more credit for that, definitely. I might have to say a little bit of credit, but I'm I'm more willing to just sacrifice ego. You know, people come on and correct me all the time. And most people will be like, oh, I need to be ready for this podcast in case I look stupid. Well, don't worry, I'll be doing plenty of that myself. So just stand next to me and you're bound to look intelligent. (laughs) So don't worry about it, okay? And I love people go, I can't believe they let you in the train department. Yeah, like, me too. I don't know. It's just because I'm there willing to learn. No one's found out yet. Shit, let's keep going. (laughs) Beautiful. This is brilliant. How many of your years can I get away with? (laughs) Thank you so much for your time today, sir. I really, really appreciate it. We will be in contact again over the next few weeks and we'll we'll start pulling some resources and and trimming the fat out of some bits and bobs to to bring people another little package of uh, some information from the Fire and Rescue Service and something that might help them. So really appreciate your time. No, thank you ever so much. And I look forward to obviously us doing it again. Thank Thank you. Firefighters podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.